Network's uh, regular webinar series. Uh, we try to have one of these uh, webinars ev uh, every Wednesday of uh, each month. Today's webinar is titled Modeling Changes in Assessments to Predict Needs and Guide Care Planning in Home Care. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, I just want to uh, just remind the attendees of some uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, just as a reminder, there's a Q&A session after uh, the, the speakers finish. Um, if you go to your side panel there, there's a, a window called questions where you could type in your questions and uh, we'll make our uh, best efforts to uh, address all questions that are uh, sent to us. A uh, second reminder, there's a, once you log off from the webinar, a, a short survey will pop up and I just want to encourage everyone to please uh, respond to the survey, give us your input in terms of the webinar itself, the subject matter, but also in terms of what uh, webinar topics we could uh, perhaps look into for future uh, presentations. Just as a reminder, the webinar slides will be up uh, one or two days on our website at cfn-nc.ca. Uh, we have a couple of webinars scheduled for April, so please uh, look for those uh, announcements or the registration information uh, soon after this webinar is, is complete. I want to thank everyone for their uh, applications for our Summer Student Awards program. Uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of uh, interest in this award program and we've uh, received uh, to date uh, just under 50 applications. The uh, application deadline is now uh, passed. It was yesterday and so again I want to thank everyone. We should have a chance to review the applications and let the uh, uh, successful applicants know that they've been awarded uh, beginning in, or sorry, uh, near the end of March or beginning in April. As a last reminder, just uh, want to want to let everyone know that the Canadian Frailty Network's 2017 annual uh, <clears throat> national conference will take place April 23rd and 24th in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, please re register on our website. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> present our speakers. Uh, Deborah Sheets is Associate Professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Victoria. She's a Fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. Uh, also speaking today is Stuart McDonald, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Victoria. His research focuses on cognitive aging and early identification of those at risk for cognitive decline and disease. And lastly, Cheryl Beach, our third speaker, is Clinical Director, Assisted Living and Abbotsford Mission Residential Care at Fraser Health. Uh, she has worked internationally in both academic and clinical settings with 20 plus years of a clinical and health care experience. So with that, uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Perry, for those introductions and to the Canadian Frailty Network for funding this project and providing the opportunity to present our, our research and findings in this webinar. Okay, so that's our opening slide with our names. And now a little bit of an intro, a little bit of an overview. Um, so background and motivations. I'll talk a little bit about the importance of identifying those at risk for a transition to residential care. We'll look at our research questions, basic modeling approach. Um, we'll close with interpreting the findings and discuss clinical applicability and then have a little bit of discussion. Okay, background. Why this research? Well, seniors overwhelmingly prefer to stay in their home with supportive services rather than transfer to a residential care facility a transition that's typically initiated due to functional decline and one that results in lower quality of life. Residential beds are a scarce and comparatively expensive healthcare resource. Because our frailty measure, we were working with Rye Home Care data, is based on, on Rye Home Care data. It can be used in multiple Canadian jurisdictions as well as other countries. The intent, our project is called eHome Eye Care, which stands for Electronic Home Intelligent Care. And our overarching goal in all our research projects is to reduce unnecessary or premature transitions. 
So our study here focused on developing a predictive frailty measure for seniors receiving home care by applying advanced analytic methods to date using the Rye Home Care data. So today we're going to be talking about predictive models of frailty that can inform decision making that we developed using this data. Next slide. Okay. In April 2015, the BC Office of the Seniors Advocate released a news report stating that up to 15% of BC seniors currently living in residential care are incorrectly housed and should be given access to assisted living or community care. So clearly there are some issues here about when it's an appropriate and timely transfer for seniors. Although an exact definition of frailty remains elusive, Frailty is often um, used as, as a reason for transferring seniors into residential care. And so it's an increasingly important concept for an aging population that prefers to live at home with supportive services. A nearly universal characteristic of frail older adults is variation, having good days versus bad days in their presentation. And so making sense of this individual variation is a major issue for healthcare professionals, and it's what we focus on in, in this research. Next slide. Okay, so the RIE Home Care, the RIE Assessment Instrument Home Care is an evaluation of status and well-being in older adults that's widely used across Canada and internationally in a variety of settings. Um, in this case, we focus on home care, but it's also used in residential care. RIE, RIE Home Care Assessments focus on characterizing individual differences in an older person's function, e.g. activities of daily living and cognition, as opposed to medical status. So the Rye Home Care is typically administered on multiple occasions for an individual. It's generally administered at least every 12 months and also when a clinically significant change occurs for those receiving home care in the home care setting. So this instrument's used across Canada, as I mentioned. And it allows us, it's, it's a good database for allowing us to evaluate whether individual rates of change in performance predict level of care transition, as well as differences in performance. And also demonstrating whether this could be nationally scalable and the potential utility of, of understanding, improving our understanding of rates of change in status uh, within the Canadian healthcare system. So in this project, we're expecting that studying how person's Rye home care scores change with time would provide very helpful and new information for future planning for, for frail seniors. So our primary research questions were, what can we learn from studying how Rye home care assessment scores change with time? And secondly, can studying how scores change help us better predict when a person will leave home care, i.e. transition to residential care, or to die. Hi everyone, it's Cheryl here. I'm going to do the next few slides. Um, so in terms of our conceptual overview for this study, um, firstly we know that all long-term care clients within home care um, across a variety of provinces in Canada receive the standardized assessment of the RIE-HC. Um, so, and, and this is captured within um, the CHI-HI database. And this, the RIE Home Care uses um, automated outputs that are used in decision making for care planning and um, helpful when uh, decisions around transitioning um, from home care into residential care. In general, secondly in general, these uh, outputs are used primarily at a single point in time um, with limited information around um, change in status or how that impacts um, the decision making. Although we know as clinicians that understanding how a person has changed and their status is an important clinical element, um, but we have yet to use um, objective and standardized tools to monitor that change. And then thirdly, we proposed that we could mathematically model an individual's change in the Rye Home Care measures to predict the likelihood that they would, would require uh, changes in level of care, such as transition to residential care. 
Um, to illustrate this, this point, we're, we're going to go through a few slides to talk, that talks about um, what's important about change in clinical decision making. So what we see in this slide, on the, um, the left-hand y-axis, we see function upwards means in uh, better function. So as we go higher up on the y-axis, it's a higher functioning. Over on the right-hand side, we have um, frailty. So as we go um, lower on the graph, it means that the person is, is more frail. Uh, the x-axis is time. And what we can see here is the red line describes a person who has a precipitous decline. So this individual um, has been, is very stable with their function, going along across time. And then they hit a certain point, and they, they decline very rapidly. The next um, line is a decision threshold. So somewhere along that decline in function and increase in frailty, a decision um, may be made that that person can no longer remain at home and needs to transition into a residential care facility. And this, the circle here represents a decision point. So at this point in time, assessment may occur um, that, that describes that this person um, may no longer be able to remain in the community and that they may need to transition. So we can see here that, um, that, that the decision point occurs at a specific point in time and, and, and doesn't necessarily take into account the previous um, information. The next slide. What we can see here is another individual, so the axes are the same. Um, and this person in the green line has fairly stable but very variable function. Um, so what we can see here is they have good days and bad days. They go up and down. And again, the, the circle point illustrates when that assessment occurs for and the decision making. So what we can see here for this individual, they may have had an assessment that brings them, they're functioning below that decision threshold, whatever that threshold is. And they may uh, then trigger, for example, um, an application to transfer into residential care. But this person may then move into residential care and actually perform quite well. And had we had better information around their trajectory and their change, uh, we may not have made that decision point um, for this particular individual. And the next slide. And here's another trajectory that we commonly see. This person is more uh, a gradual decline. Um, again, we see the assessment occurring at that decision threshold um, and a decision being made. They have a very different trajectory um, than, than the precipitous decline or the variable and functioning decline. And the next slide. So when we bring all these three different um, profiles together, you can see that um, Although the, at the decision point, these individuals may have looked similarly and may have contributed to a decision making for transition, had we known which trajectory they belonged to, whether they were a precipitous decline, a gradual decline, or their, their, their performance was variable, we actually clinically might make quite different decisions um, knowing this profile. If we only have the snapshot in time, um, this decision point, then we, we have limited information. So our question then is, could it be helpful using past change information to help us predict what a f the future performance might be? Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about the methods. Um, within our methods, as Deborah already mentioned, we, we use the, um, the Rye Home Care Assessment. For those of you not familiar with it, it's developed by an international collaborative group um, called InterI that is focused on improving the quality of life for vulnerable persons across the continuum of care. Um, within the RI out, um, assessment, there are a number of outputs, um, including clinical assessment protocols for care planning, outcome scales for measuring change, uh, resource group utilizations, and quality, quality indicators. Um, in this presentation, we'll primarily focus on, on the outcome scales. Next slide. 
The outcome scales that we were most interested in in terms of predicting potential transition to residential care include the activities of daily living long form scale. That's a scale that uh, ranges from 0 to 28. And it um, includes seven different activities of daily living items, including mobility, dressing, personal hygiene, those types of items. Uh, we were also interested in um, the cognitive performance scale, or the CPS, which ranges from 0 to 6. This scale has been validated with the, the mini mental, the MMSE. Um, with all of these uh, RI scales, the 0 means the person has higher functioning and the higher number means they are more impaired or have poorer function. Um, just as a, a, the C, a, a score of a C3 on the cognitive performance scale indicates uh, moderate cognitive impairment, and it's around about a 15 on the MMSE. Uh, we were also interested in the chest score, um, which measures health instability, um, and it ranges from 0 to 5. And generally speaking, the 3 or more indicates um, um, health instability. Uh, we were also looked at the instrumental activities of daily living scale and the involvement scale, which goes from 0 to 21. And this indicates um, individuals' performance on ideal activities such as transportation, shopping, um, managing finances, and managing their medications. We looked at the MAPLE score. Uh, many of you who are familiar with uh, home care will, will be familiar with the MAPLE, which is a method for assigning priority level. It ranges from 0 to 5. And those clients with a score of 4 or 5 are potentially at high or very high risk for transitioning into residential care. The MAPLE consists of uh, um, a, a number of different items from the RIE home care assessment, including um, their cognitive performance, their activities of daily living, falls, um, medication management, uh, skin pressure, so a variety of, of items from there. And then um, just recognizing that the RIE has a number of different outcome scores associated with it um, that we did, were not included in this analysis, but there certainly are a, um, a number of others available. Next slide. Um, so in terms of the RIE home care in, in Canada, uh, we, uh, it has been mandated across eight provinces in, in Canada um, and is part of the national reporting system um, through CAIHI. Um, and CAIHI now has at least 3 million assessments um, across Canada and there are approximately 400,000 assessments per year. So quite a substantial database. Next slide. Just to give you um, a little bit of uh, a picture of what this client group looks like, we, we looked at BC and home care um, and Ontario data. Um, this, this data is all available publicly through the CAIHI Quick Stats. And in 2015-16, uh, BC had almost 35,000 assessed clients, whereas Ontario had over 182,000. The average age was slightly higher in BC. Um, BC also has a slightly higher percentage of population with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, Ontario has slightly higher percentage of folks who need extensive help with their activities of daily living. Um, the mild cognitive impairment is fairly similar. However, when you look at the data using the cognitive performance scale of three or more, uh, BC tends to have a little higher percentage of people with that moderate cognitive impairment in the community. Um, health instability, a little higher in, in BC. Um, IEDLs, um, a little higher in Ontario. And depression and their, um, the, the MAPLE score of 4 or 5, a little higher in BC. So in general, we saw um, some, some, some mild differences across the two provinces. Um, but more consistent than highly different. Next slide. Okay, just in terms of how it worked for our sample, um, we, we chose to use the, uh, we looked at the uh, CAIHI HCR database, which had over 914,000 um, clients. You can click through that, Stuart. Yeah. Um, we excluded 
um, people who did not live in Ontario, we chose to use the Ontario population as the um, the uh, frequency of assessments was a bit higher and the data quality was a little higher. So we ended up then with about 500, 000, over 500,000 clients. We then excluded all people who had less than two Rye Home Care assessments. As this study was really about um, monitoring, looking at change and how change could contribute to our decision making, uh, we could only include people who had more than um, two assessments. So when we took that group out, our study population ended up to be um, over 315,000 um, clients, uh, over 1.3 million assessments, and on average each client had about four, um, four assessments. And what did their, our cohort look like then for this study? We had about 33% who were diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. About 20% had moderate cognitive impairment or that a CPS of three or more. 52% had experienced a recent decline in their ADL. Almost half had a maple four or five, which means they were at um, high or very high risk of, of um, either caregiver burnout, needing services, and potential transition to residential care. About 18% um, had some health instability with a chest score of three or more. 27% reported caregiver distress. 29% lived alone. And the bulk of them, almost 90%, had difficulties with their IADLs. And next slide. OK, so readings all. Uh, Stuart McDonald chiming in at, uh, at this point. Um, Deborah and Cheryl, thank you for the overviews. Um, so there were really, from a quantitative perspective, two primary objectives that we were focused on. And, and the first really involved whether or not uh, there was uh, not only significant change for a number of these rise subscales, IDL, CPS, for example, that Cheryl mentioned, but whether or not there were significant individual differences in change for these scales as well. Um, I think we know uh, clinically based on experience uh, as well as um, looking at the, the values within the forms that even across a six month or one year period that a fair amount of change can, can occur. But one of the key questions, at least from the perspective of prospective identification or sensitivity, is whether or not there's significant individual differences within that change. And uh, after achieving that, that first objective, the second one was saying, OK, so uh, if we were able to identify not only average levels of performance, which are conventionally used in terms of the RI, as well as these rates of change for various subscales, we wanted to combine that information along with a number of standards, uh, covariates and predictors, delirium, dementia status, caregiver status, age, and use all those pieces of information to develop a, a weighted equation, basically, to, to see whether or not we could uh, improve our identification of individuals who were at risk of transitioning from, uh, from home care, their current context, to residential care. And so with regard to this first analytic objective, what we effectively did is we employed uh, linear mixed or, or multi-level models of change for this Ontario cohort for uh, a number of these key RI subscales, again, that Cheryl overviewed. And so we treated each one of those uh, as an individual dependent measure at the outset. And as I mentioned, we wanted to model the information to ascertain not only whether or not, on average, impairment in ADL, for example, or IADLs were increasing over time, but whether or not there were significant individual differences as well. And so this equation uh, at the bottom is a very simple linear mixed model equation. Basically, a given individual's uh, assessment, uh, everybody has one, and, and those assessments can also be repeated across multiple points in time. And so that information for each person was being modeled as a function of their most recent RI assessment, which is how the, uh, the information from the RI is most typically used, 
as well as uh, a rate of change uh, annualized for each additional year reflecting, um, for example, what the magnitude of increase in impairment is for IADL, for example, or in terms of, of CPS. And uh, ultimately, from running these models, what we can actually do is we can come up with an estimate of not only the value um, in a population-based way for their most recent assessment, but also estimates of their individual rates of change. So, so not the population average rate of change, but their individual rate of change. And, and um, several other components in that model, the, the so-called random effects, tell us whether or not there are significant between-person differences in terms of their most recent assessment. Are some people more, more impaired than others? Uh, yes, of course, that's the case. Um, and uh, similarly, are some people more prone to exhibiting greater rates of increases or greater rates of change, specifically in terms of increasing impairment over time? And the answer to that question was also yes. So uh, rather than uh, table uh, all of this uh, information in an overwhelming way, here's just one uh, simple hypothetical overview of the uh, the maple for three uh, specific clients. Uh, so the maple score here on the y-axis, time represented here on the, the x-axis, and as conventionally used, uh, an individual would have an assessment, and the scores of that most recent assessment would be used to inform whether or not this individual um, uh, should be admitted to residential care, for example, or should remain in, in home care. And, and what you see based on these two most recent assessments, um, or sorry, in this case, there are three pieces of information. The individuals in blue and green have a very high maple score, whereas the individual in red has a high maple score. There isn't much really to differentiate these individuals in terms of their most recent assessment. But if we, if we also bring change into the picture, and, and this individual in red is an interesting one, for example. So two years ago, they had a, uh, a high maple score, um, but over time, they showed stability in that maple score. It didn't increase at year one or year two. So even though they have a most recent assessment level of high, their relative stability might indicate that they're a good candidate for remaining in their home as opposed to transitioning. And in contrast, the, the individual depicted by the, the blue slope actually shows a fairly low risk at, at the initial assessment, but for each additional year uh, that they're in the study is increasing by uh, two units on, uh, in terms of rates of change on the, on the maple. So that individual is not only showing uh, very high risk of, of transition at the most recent assessment, but their change score is also corroborating that. Their, their risk has been increasing uh, rather sizably in those preceding two years. So that's, uh, that was really the, the general impetus. Identify not only mean performance, but also uh, rates of change. And, and having done that, we then took that information and, and we, uh, at the second step, entered this into a transition risk model. So effectively, uh, the initial models employed multinomial logistic regression. So individuals coded as zero were in home care, those with one transition to, to residential care. These, um, these models uh, controlled for uh, mortality and a number of, uh, of other things. But long story short, um, looking at both level and change information, we wanted to incorporate both of those elements into this prediction risk model and see whether or not um, the relative importance of change mattered over and above the most recent assessment score, for example. So does change matter as much or more than mean? And combined, can all of this information improve our ability to detect those at risk of transitioning to residential care? And uh, here is one very simple example of some tabled results from one of these logistic models, um, really highlighting uh, what's referred to here as level, which is mean performance reflecting the most recent assessment, and, uh, and change. 
So for a number of the covariates uh, in the model, not surprisingly, if you were uh, older, for example, or cognitively impaired versus not, you are more likely to uh, experience the modeled outcome, which is transition to residential care in this regard. Now, the one of the key initial pieces of information was whether or not change does tell us anything more, and whether or not you're looking at instrumental activities or CPS or CHESS or ADL, those bold odds ratios tell us that in every single instance, the, uh, the change information was in fact uh, significant, independent of that most recent assessment. So the simple answer is there's no doubt the most recent assessment and level information is critically important and it's been used to good effect uh, clinically. But these findings also suggest that the change information can and in fact do provide additional information over and above that most recent assessment. And so if you look at the likelihood of experiencing the transition risk within every one of these RISE subscales, in each case the corresponding estimate for change is actually greater um, than, the, um, than the estimate for level reflecting the most recent assessment. So um, again, at least from um, uh, the perspective of uh, corroborating some of our initial theorizing, not only was there significant change, the average person increased in impairment, there were significant differences in that change. Some people were quite impaired but remained stable. Some people really were increasing in their impairment. That information matters from the perspective of modeling transition risk. So the, uh, the third step, and it's uh, still really a proof of principle stage that, uh, that we're examining uh, at present, we, we wanted to, to take that information, and I think the real litmus test is to say, okay, it's fine to create uh, a weighted algorithm on the basis of a, a population data, or in this case, the Ontario um, home care cohort, but uh, can you then use this um, algorithm to actually uh, prospectively use a given client's information to identify their own personal transition risk within clinical context. Uh, the retrospective demonstration is very interesting, but as always, uh, the, the, real, um, the real test is whether or not this information is prospectively useful. So, um, so that initial uh, equation, again, that I, that I showed, the logistic equation, yielded these weighted uh, coefficients for us. Um, as it turns out, you can um, basically solve this equation by taking each one of the corresponding weighted coefficients that we derived and multiply it by a raw score uh, for an individual, so a given individual's age, their impairment status, their IDL score, and if you sum up all of that, that information, the, the raw score variables multiplied by the coefficients, you get uh, a single value that is yielded in log of odds units in terms of their likelihood to transition. And, and so at least the mere mortals uh, uh, among us don't necessarily do that well in terms of thinking and log odds, so there's a couple of very simple transformations. You, you convert the information first to odds by taking this sum score and basically uh, exponentiating that value, and one more conversion requires you to convert that information to a simple probability and uh, to derive the probability, you just have to take the ratio of odds divided by one plus the odds. So on the basis of that, that weighted equation, uh, here are a couple of very simple practical examples where we did exactly that. We solved the equation for a given individual's information and, and we derived their probability of transition risk. So for this 71-year-old uh, uh, female uh, without dementia, uh, you can see here based on these scores, there is at least some indication of, um, uh, of impairment based on both the, the instrumental as well as the, uh, the ADL estimates, uh, some evidence based on the CPS of mild cognitive impairment and some, some increases in terms of reliance based on both the, the IADL and the, the ADL information. 
And if I take that weighted equation that we derive based on the Ontario cohort and we enter in this, this raw uh, information, oh, sorry for this uh, formatting issue, we, um, we derive a predicted probability score of about 8% for this given individual. So um, not, not that high and, and uh, for clinicians on the call, uh, not that surprising, I would say either. Now, in, in contrast, as a second example, uh, this is uh, an 85-year-old male uh, with dementia. What you see are similar uh, profiles of impairment, uh, a slight bit more in terms of IDL and ADL relative to the, uh, the female on the left. Um, the CPS score exhibits significantly more cognitive impairments so already at a moderate level. And the, uh, the change information, the level of reliance for, uh, for this specific male is clearly uh, increasing and has increased quite a bit uh, annualized in the, in the previous year. So if we enter that same raw information for this individual into uh, the weighted equation, what we come up with uh, is almost a fourfold increase in the, the transition risk probability for that 85-year-old male as opposed to the 71-year-old the uh, female. And at this juncture, what we're, what we're actually doing is we're um, further refining our, uh, our equations. So this and, is Deborah, and I'm going to talk about the implications in future directions. And next slide, please. Okay, so basically, thank you, Stuart. What our findings show is that rather than classifying individuals based on clinical norms and their associated cutoffs, our approach, which allows individuals to serve as his or her own baseline and to investigate personal change from this baseline, um, can represent a sensitive marker for those at risk for transition. In short, person-centered care typically involves thinking of patients as equal partners in planning, developing, and monitoring care to make sure it meets their needs. Our hope is that this kind of approach, which uses individuals as their own baseline, allows us to personalize care in a meaningful way and to prevent inappropriate transitions while also being able to predict when it is time to move someone up to a higher level of care, hopefully prior to adverse events occurring. So in short, our results show that these change scores have a significant impact in predicting adverse events, such as placement, and we looked at placement in residential care and, in, and death. And to use these change scores in combination, of course, always with other assessments and clinical indicators that it will be useful in assisting care planning and potentially delay placement. In terms of ongoing research, we're hoping our next steps Basically, we plan to implement this frailty measure with healthcare professionals working with home care clients. And we want to demonstrate this proof of principle, the impact of this frailty algorithm on decision-making, services utilization, and also health outcomes. Now, our next directions in terms of research, we've got a number of projects going on. We've got an Island Health Research Award. And with this project, we're going to be looking at early detection of changes in health status um, by exploring correlations between continuous in-home sensor data, ubiquitous monitoring, and looking at intermittent um, assessments of cognition, mobility, and functional status. So this research is going to help us extend um, some of our frailty work into actual additional clinical assessments. We also have a study from the Michael Smith Foundation for um, Healthcare Research. It's a collaborative grant, and we're going to be pulling together a group of experts to help guide selection of an appropriate suite of technologies and integrated systems which will help support seniors living in assisted living. And our goal here is to, to match up, um, again, technology, continuous data from technologies with assessments, which are the gold standard. Um, to ideally identify and detect changes in, in healthcare status earlier and uh, to allow additional supports to be put in place. Lastly, we have a study that will be looking at, oh, that will be looking at, um, it's a CIHR catalyst 
grant that we've applied for, it's been submitted, we're assessing three competing definitions of frailty and their usefulness in predicting adverse health outcomes. So this work will, um, there isn't a gold standard yet for um, how we look at frailty, and we're hoping to actually test the utility, the, the conceptual underpinnings of frailty um, using um, CLSA data, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging data, um, which will allow us to, to kind of compare across these definitions and see which ones are the most useful. And so with that, I'd like to make some acknowledgments. I want to thank the Canadian Frailty Network for funding this project and allowing us the opportunity to present our, our findings on this webinar. Island Health, which funded some of our initial um, research looking at frailty and home care um, clients and the Canadian Institute for Health Information, which has provided us with access to the Rye Home Care data. Our final slide lists our research team, which includes Dr. Jeff Poss at the University of Waterloo, who brings considerable expertise on Rye, on Rye Home Care data, Dr. Andy Mitz at the National Institutes of Mental Health in the United States, um, the National Institutes of Health, and brings um, experience in neurological, um, neuropsychological testing. And I've also listed, of course, um, Cheryl Beach and some other team members, Carl Ash, who focuses on outcomes research, Paul Brewster, who helped us a great deal with all our, our, of our advanced analytic modeling. And our other team members are listed on the left there also under the University of Victoria. So we've got quite a diverse interdisciplinary team and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to do this work. We look forward to having your questions, and I will turn it back over to, um, to CFN to moderate our discussion. Thank you, Perry. Great. Thanks, Deborah, and thank you, uh, Stuart and Cheryl, as well. A very interesting talk, and uh, I know it's early, but it looks very promising. Um, so I'll just give a few... I'll just give a few more moments for questions to come in, and as they come in, um, just a quick question that I had, and, and certainly not an area that I, I truly appreciate or understand that much about in terms of... I'm not uh, hearing anything. Can you hear us now, Deborah? Cheryl or uh, Stuart, can you hear us? I can hear you at Cheryl, yes. Okay. Yes, I do as well, Perry. That's great. Deborah must have some uh, technical issues then. Okay, so I'll start questions in just a moment. I'll, uh, I'll contact Deborah. Okay. Thank you. Stuart, maybe you could a answer this question. One of the things that uh, occurred to me, and again, I don't appreciate this uh, area well enough to uh, know the process, but currently, how is uh, Rye Home Care assessments used in terms of um, decision making uh, with respect to going to residential care. Is it, um, so is it, it seems to be a single sort of measure and at which point if you're uh, deemed to be fairly um, vulnerable based on sort of the mean scores, are you considered for residential care or well, maybe you could take us through the process? Sure, and uh, full uh, disclosure, I'm neither clinical lead nor, nor clinician, um, so Cheryl, you might want to weigh in on this as well, but um, the information is most certainly uh, used, uh, at least uh, based on Island Health, we, um, and, and my guess is that many of the other health authorities it would be uh, as well. While they would take into account, for example, levels of uh, cognitive impairment, most certainly if we're looking at residential care, uh, nobody is surprised to, to learn that in many contexts, greater than 50% than of the residents uh, have some form of uh, dementia. But uh, I, I would say one of the, uh, the linchpins, uh, at least in terms of transition risk here, as I understood our discussions with clinical leads would pertain to activities of daily living. So typically the more uh, impairments and the more recent experiment, uh, impairments that individuals are exhibiting in that regard beyond um, yeah, difficulties with, with bathing, which I think is a pretty common one, um, that, that would often precipitate a decision. Yeah, and, and Cheryl here, if I could add a little bit to that. Um, so typically we work with um, provincial uh, definitions um, around um, eligibility criteria for people 
transitioning into residential care. And it's usually a combination of what their um, functioning level is. So as Stuart mentioned, like what's their cognitive functioning, what is their ADL functioning, in combination with um, both informal and formal care supports that are provided. So we typically use information from the RIE home care assessment to provide some baseline eligibility criteria um, uh, to um, that goes into who can transition into residential care. And that's used in combination with the client goals and preferences, as well as um, informal caregiver ability and the, the formal care that, that's available to sort of put all the pieces together in terms of can someone um, be supported at home or do we need to look at the transition? OK, great. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> it seems like there is a, quite a bit of shared decision making in terms of location of care. Um, we're getting a number of questions now, and so I'll um, just go through some of the ones, sort of uh, collate them in, in some respects in terms of um, sort of the general thoughts. Uh, you get certainly a lot of uh, uh, comments about uh, impressive work, and, and thank you very much for, uh, uh, for this work. Um, one of the questions from Helen Ulan Kuntz, um, and I only mention her because of her uh, specific question here. We are also examining change in frailty over time using RIE home care data, but in adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities only. One of our technical challenges is varying time between assessments, anything from approximately six months to several years. How did you handle this in your work? Yeah, that's um, it's an excellent uh, question, of course, and and uh, in in part uh, we have uh, we included within a number of our models time under study to to try to um, effectively incorporate that information as a covariate. Our um, our challenge was perhaps not as great as uh, as yours in that uh, in the Ontario data. The, the retest intervals seem to be a, a fairly standard six months uh, to to a year, give or take, in Island Health. I, I guess it was a, a year represented the average retest intervals. So it was less problematic from the perspective of, uh, of annualizing that change. But a lot of our, our initial work um, beyond the clinical applicability really focused on precisely those issues. Well, how um, how variable was the retest interval? Was there any evidence for uh, curvilinear uh, effects or did linear or annualized effects um, basically explain the trajectories um, quite sufficiently? Okay, thank you, uh, Stuart. Um, another question by Mike McFadden. Again, I mentioned um, uh, his name because of the specific question. Uh, my questions are so in relation to the evaluation of such tools and the assessment of residents in long-term care as it is critical in my work to assure anticipatory education and support to residents and families living in these environments to optimize their care and quality of life. Are there particular evaluative tools you might advise apart from CHESS, such as Frailty Index, PPS, etc as well as any outcome measures we might use to assure we are achieving our aim for optimal care, particularly in end-stage disease. Um, yeah, that's an, a, a great question as well. It's Cheryl here. Um, I. I don't think that we, in our early analysis, we did look at um, how a different um, frailty measures um, worked with the, the Rye, and we particularly looked at the, the Rye Home Care and the Rockwood. Um, but in terms of um, end-of-life care and the use of the chest, I, I don't have anything further to add around that, and I'm not sure if um, Deborah does. It's a very, it's a very good question and, and a difficult one. I hesitate to, to make any recommendations. I think additional work needs to be done in this area, quite honestly. 
and it uh, and Stuart quickly chiming in. We also looked at the crosswalk of the Edmonton frailty scale. Um, the question is very interesting in that it almost um, scaffolds upon what what the initial um, focus was here, which was looking at uh, the transition risk for anybody who's um, currently in home care to um, to residential. Um, uh, although I grant it, I, I, I see the central importance of um, those themes, quality of life included, uh, regardless of context that you're in. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question we have, very nice research and interesting presentation. At uh, some point, you indicated wanting to examine caregiver stress indicators in your model. Uh, unless I missed these results, did you examine caregiver stress as a predictor? Hi, it's Sarah. We did look at the um, the care what's available in the RIE assessment around caregiver status. Um, it didn't initially come up um, as a significant um, factor, um, and I'll let Stuart um, sort of follow up with that. Yeah, and I, I, so it's another um, excellent question, I think. And, and so um, clinically speaking, of course, I think all of that uh, information would be used to make um, an informed clinical judgment. Of course, what's interesting when it comes to the methodological application, um, ultimately we entered uh, a number of those indicators. and. What we found uh, is that many, uh, in many instances, they didn't uniquely contribute independent of the other predictors in the model. So, of course, that's not to say that they, they aren't important. Uh, we know clinically that they, they are useful markers, but with a, uh, the multivariate nature of the model that we were building, uh, it, it seemed that there were enough redundant sources of variance contributed by some of the other measures that um, important markers from caregiver stress to even delirium, for example, in instances didn't uniquely contribute to transition risk independent of all the other information included in the model. Excellent. Um, maybe uh, two, two more questions. Um, this one maybe perhaps goes to uh, sort of what you're planning on doing in terms of future research and follow-on studies. Uh, the question is simply, will additional follow-up of the clients and the research be completed in terms of the outcome? This is Deborah. Um, we aren't planning to, to rerun these models using additional data at this point. I think our goal is to, to actually um, develop a tool and, and test the proof of principle with clinicians in home care. and. Uh, our preliminary meetings with home care providers have shown that they think that this could be very useful. They typically try to look at change in a client, but it's it's kind of it's not done in a real systematic way. It's more just um, knowing the client over time and and thinking, you know, looking at their most recent assessment, looking back maybe one one time point, which may have been six months earlier, and making a judgment based on that. So they were quite interested in seeing. Um, testing this tool and seeing, you know, whether they could plug in a few things and see if it would be useful in um, identifying sort of what the trajectory of, tra trajectory of change is in a client and uh, how that might inform their, their decision making. Yeah, and that's, uh, I would echo those um, emphases for sure. So we, we are excited about looking at proof of principle, there's a, a few different weighted equations that we're going to be looking at. In addition to some of the very basic stuff we presented, we of course need to look at some of the gold standard uh, indicators, area under the ROC curve based on whatever equation we're advocating for, sensitivity for example, um, so on and so forth. But absolutely we want to be able to demonstrate uh, the prospective utility of this and that involves systematically comparing and contrasting models that include change to those that don't include change to models that are just predicated on the maple, for example, which is uh, another algorithm that's commonly used to identify those uh, individuals at increased risk of transition. So um, definitely represents a priority next step for us. 
Mm, fair enough. Um, sounds quite interesting. Uh, so the last comment, since we're coming up to the top of the hour, is from Kelly K. And again, I only mention it because of her comment. Uh, very exciting and so relevant to the work that is happening in Ontario related to the development of levels of care framework. Uh, she would love to help link you to Ontario policymakers, as this is pre this predictive capacity has arisen in some of our feedback to this Ontario work. So uh, we're happy to forward Kelly Kay's coordinates to you if you're not uh, familiar with uh, uh, who she is. Just as a as a side note. So it, it just a real opportunity. Right? Okay, I'll do so. Um, just want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar series or webinar. Uh, just a reminder again that there will be a post webinar survey that will pop up on your screen and just remind everyone that there's two webinars scheduled for April the 12th and the 26th. Again, I'd like to thank Deborah, Stewart and Cheryl for an excellent talk and until next time, bye-bye. Uh,